Okay, when we left off, I showed you the equations of motion for a planet mass or mass small m that circles around the sun, which we say is a mass of m. Okay, and using that or using those formulas, I'm going to show Kepler's laws. Okay, now it's a bit of an irony that the law that I'm going to show first is obviously the easier one, okay, but it kind of turns out to be, it looks like the hardest one to show, and that is the Kepler, Kepler's law number two. And that is the planet, okay, that goes around the, the sun, that revolves around the sun, sweeps out equals areas by the line segment that joins the planet or Earth to the sun, okay? Uh, just to illustrate, so big M is the sun, Earth, small m is the Earth, so we are going around like this, okay? And then basically the area that is swept up from here to here is the same as the area swept up from here to here if the time interval is the same, okay? if the time interval is the same. So that's what we're going to show and we are going to just start off uh, using the equations of motion. Okay, last video, using uh, running through the gauntlet of, of algebra, we managed to derive two equations of motion. This is one of them, okay? I say again, um, we define the axis as x and y, as in the, the okay, we, that's, an, that's an x and y axis, but we're not really using that axis for our calculations. Instead, we are going to define another axis, okay, which we would label as small u r and sm um, small u theta, vector u r, vector u theta, okay, where this vector u r, okay, is the unit vector that joins from the sun to the earth, okay, the reason why we do that is because that the axis keeps on uh, revolving as the planet moves around the planet, it's, it's all fine, it's, it's still okay because theta changes and again we got theta inside the equation over here, so it all seems to fall into place, okay, and then we also last left off with the force that goes from here, okay, which is FR, and the force that goes from here. Yeah, correct, the force that goes from here, which is F theta, okay? Uh, meaning to say that whatever force that acts on the Earth, small m, we can uh, resolve it into two perpendicular forces, one along the axis joining the Sun and the Earth, and the other one is perpendicular to the axis, okay? And F theta and FR defines the, the magnitude, okay, the magnitude of the force, okay? Over here, like that. Now, so if you go into a classroom and you and the teacher asks you, okay, I want you to prove one of Kepler's laws. Just pick the second one, okay? Because the second one is very easy to show, okay? I'm gonna show it to you now. Now, what do we know about the, the force that the sun exerts on the earth? Or uh, yeah, sorry, the sun exerts on the earth. We know that it's a force that is in the direction of the line segment that joins the two, okay? That means the force is gonna be like that, okay? The force is going to be like that. It's going to be what we call a central force, okay? Newton's, that's, that's what Newton said. The universal law of gravitation acts from planet to planet, is directed towards each other. So, when we define the axis like this, okay, notice that this component, the F theta component of the force that acts perpendicular to the axis, it's zero because the forces is only, the forces that the sun exists is only traveling in the direction towards it in the light segment, which is perpendicular to this. So, we can just simply write F theta as zero because there's no component. And then after that, we will just simply divide by M, which will get zero. And this just simply equals to this whole equation over here plus two dr dt times with d theta dt is equals to zero. Okay, so from here, let's attempt to show the Kepler's law number two, the area swept up is the same given the same time interval. Okay, so what I'm gonna do over here, now you suspect that there's gonna be a dA somewhere in there and a d theta, right? So obviously we got a d theta over here, okay? Now what I'm gonna do, is this takes some um, algebra manipulation as always, that I'm gonna multiply r throughout, okay? r, that means the radius. I'm gonna multiply r throughout, so I got r squared, d, d2 d theta, d2 theta, d, d t2, plus 2r dr dt times d theta dt, okay, r times 0 is 0. Now, why do I not do that? Because I can recognize that there is the product rule hidden inside there, okay? There's the product rule hidden inside there, and I will get this when I differentiate something with respect to t. t comes in because later I will need to integrate based on the, the change in time. So I'm going to try to get the, the t somewhere. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write a d, dt, and let's see whether we can find what is this, which shouldn't be a problem at all, okay? What we know about the product rule? The product rule is that we have two products, okay, and we'll put one down, we differentiate the other one, and the other one goes down here and we differentiate the one that we did not differentiate, add them up together. The add sign is here, 
And notice that there's an R square and there's a 2R over here. So I'm suspecting that one of the products is going to be an R square. Make sense? One of the products is going to be an R square. So that the R square comes here and then I'm going to like, okay, the R square goes here and I'm going to differentiate this thing to get me this thing over here. Well, it looks like it's going to be d theta dt, is that correct? Yeah, I believe so, yes, d theta dt. There we go, that's the product we want to find. Okay, let's verify. So I'm going to differentiate this with respect to t using product rule. R squared goes here, differentiate d theta dt, we will get d2 theta dt2, okay, the second derivative. Now, differentiate, now we, we want to keep this now for the second, pro, uh, second sum, sorry, the second component. This one goes here, Differentiate this with respect to theta, we employ chain rule. Differentiate r first, or differentiate this with, with respect to r. 2 comes here, r comes here, then differentiate the inside, which is dr d theta, which is over here. It's fine. So basically, we got this equation over here like that. Okay? So now, what we can do next, well, we can just simply integrate, okay, with respect to t. Okay? We integrate with respect to t, and then we got r squared d theta dt equals to h, where h is just some sort of constant, basic integration, okay? So this equation is the one that we have, okay? I'll just rewrite the equation over here so that I can quickly show you the calculus law number two, okay? Bearing in mind that this equation, though it seems very small, it's in fact fundamentally useful in proving the other two laws. So it's good to get a hang of this equation for now. R squared times d theta dt is equal to a constant h. So let's consider via the, the usual calculus methods, okay, that we want to find a small area over here like that, which we will label as dA. Now, this small angle here would be d theta because the angle is small. Now, what is the area? Well, we know if that the angles is expressed in radians, okay, for any sort of circle, we have the area is equal to half, half r squared theta, correct? For an angle, for an area which is subtended by the angle theta and for the circle having a radius r. So we can just simply employ this over here starting with dA. So dA is equals to half, now what's r? r is r squared, so that's the same. Okay, what is theta? Theta is d theta, okay? Because remember, it's a small angle that sweeps out whatever area that is. And then now, we define the function as a as the area that is swept out after a certain time, okay? After a certain time, uh, that's the function that we define a. And now from here, we can just simply employ our usual rules of calculus, okay? But before that, we need to make a substitution, which is this one over here. Remember, we're integrating with respect to time, so we need the time interval inside there. That's not a problem, because this is simply equals to h, h times dt, uh, dt, correct, okay? We just simply rearrange this equation, okay? We will get r squared d theta equals to h dt. That's good. We can substitute this one inside here. So we got dA, okay, dA is equals to half h dt, okay? And then we will just put a, or oh, sorry, the difference in the area. So remember, we're going from the area from at t, t2, okay? So let's just say t2 is here. T1 is here, okay? We're taking reference from, just, just say T0 is over here, okay? It doesn't matter because we're dealing with the difference, okay? So the area of, uh, area at T2, subtract the area of T1, okay? Is equal to the integrate of T1 to T2 of half H dt. And knowing that half and H are constants, we can just simply bring them out, H, and then put D, T2, take away T1. And there we go, cap plus second law. Okay, what does that mean? That means that let's just say I'm concerned in finding areas of, of two time intervals. Whatever the time interval may be, it can be anything, okay? So let's just say T2 is here, T1 is here, T2 is here, T1 is here. All the, all the different time intervals. And this is the sun, and this is the area that's swept out. So this give expression gives me the difference in the area, right? Correct. The area at T2 subtract the area at T1. So it's the area down here and it's the area down here. Okay. And the value will just get a certain value. It will all be equal, okay, if the difference is the same. That is why you will see uh, T2 and T1 over there. Okay. So if, as long as the difference is the same, it will just give me, okay, the area swept out is it will be equal to the area swept out by the planet at that same time interval, no matter where. The, the orbit, no matter where the planet is in, in the orbit, okay? And there we go, Kepler second law, 
want to show your friends how to do it, uh, this is it, okay? Um, the, the, the first law is coming out and that is like three times more difficult than this. But I'll give it a best shot, okay?